All right, our next uh, examination of uh, phylogeny of the uh, chordate groups, we're going to look specifically at first the fish as a separate group and then the tetrapods as uh, a group and look in, in more detail at what's going on there with those taxa. Uh, just to, to look back quickly, a reminder of where we've been. Uh, Eurochordata and cephalochordata separated by this trait, somites and segmental nerves. Next up we have the hagfish, the first craniate group, so we have the neurocranium. It's made of cartilage, there's neural crest tissue for the first time and paired sense organs for the first time in the craniate. So the hagfish is the most primitive craniate, considered most primitive because it does not contain vertebrae. Next thing up, vertebral elements are added and we have the lamprey group there. So those are our two agnathan fish, fish without jaws, the hagfish and the lamprey. Next we add jaws and then we have the chondrichthyan or cartilaginous fish, uh, shark, skates, rays, and uh, rat fishes. These are known as nathostomes. Natho refers to jaw, mouth, stones. And uh, then we add to the fish the air bladder. Now these are going to be called bony fish, these next two groups bony fish because they have, instead of a mainly cartilaginous endoskeleton, they start to show some bone, presence of bone in that inner skeleton. So we sometimes refer to these as bony fish, but specifically the actinopterygian fishes over here, first group to show uh, with the air bladder, those are the ray fin fishes. And then we add the f fleshy fin base, a muscular base and in the fin, uh, supported by some, some skeletal elements there in the sarcopterygian fishes. These are your coelacanth and lungfish uh, categories over here. All the other fish are over here in the actinopterygian group, all the other bony fish. So those, that finishes out all of our fish. And now we go on to tetrapods. So we have four-legged animals that are on land primarily. Uh, amphibians, the first group here, includes your frogs, salamanders, and caecilians. Then above that we have uh, Amniotes, all these have an amniotic egg and a special membrane that surrounds the embryo during development. We also see for the first time epidermal scales, scales formed in the epidermis instead of the dermis as we saw in the other fish down here. So epidermal scales show up here. And in the reptilia we also include birds. Birds have feathers, we know that. So if I had another group here for birds, we just add feathers to our phylogeny chart. So anyway, these are our first amniotes, the reptiles. And uh, then beyond that, we have the mammals. The mammals are characterized by having hair, mammary tissue, and three middle ear bones. So that's just a quick review of where we've been with our phylogeny. Now we're going to look specifically at the, uh, at the fish. All right, now we're going to begin our fish phylogeny uh, look here. Um, the first two fish in our lineage, the hagfish and the lamprey, you need to know a little bit about these and why they're different. We identified the primary difference between hagfish and lamprey as the presence of some vertebral elements in the lamprey, which we don't see in hagfish. They both have cartilage, the beginning is of cartilage, especially uh, we, we associate with the head skeleton in the hagfish. Uh, that's why we call it a craniate organism because there's some cartilage supports around the, uh, the head there in uh, these groups. So we see the beginnings of that. There's also some cartilage in a support for the tongue which is really important to the hagfish and lamprey and uh, supporting the gill structure around the pharynx uh, in both of these. So anyway, as we said, first thing we see is separates the two groups vertebral elements some other important things to know about these groups first of all the hagfish is exclusively a marine organism lives in the oceans down in the, uh, in the bottom of the ocean where they are parasitic not parasitic they are scavengers 
scavengers on dead material, things that fall to the bottom of the ocean. Mainly we think of dead fish. Uh, there's a, uh, in one of the Blue Planet series of uh, programs on television you may have seen, there's a giant whale at the bottom of the ocean that's died and is being decomposed and the hagfish feeding on that with hundreds of hagfish uh, there. So anyway, they uh, like to go in and find a way into the soft parts of the body so that they would try to eat out the insides and soft organs of the body of whatever they're scavenging on first. Uh, the hagfish has uh, not teeth like our teeth, not with enamel and dentin and all that. They have uh, keratinized teeth. It's more like your fingernail material, the keratin material. But uh, still, it's fairly uh, tough and, and forms sharp spines that allows them to rasp at whatever they're, they're eating. It's on the end of their tongue, so they can kind of uh, tear at flesh using that tongue. Uh, they do not undergo a larval stage like the lamprey does. We'll talk about that in a minute, so they, they don't have a larval stage of development. Uh, water and food will come into their mouth and can be expelled uh, the food goes into their digestive system, but the water can be expelled through gill slits. Sometimes this opening from the uh, pharynx uh, that goes outward goes into a channel that feet goes further back on the body and then has exit ports further back, like an exhaust system in your car would have. So that the water comes in, travels through a tube, and then out uh, pours on the side. It varies uh, from species to species, and there's a lot of variability on how that uh, exit from the, phary the uh, pharynx is expressed in the hagfish uh, taxa. Now the lamprey, I mentioned that it has a larval stage of development. It's known as the amoceti. The amoceti larva looks a lot like our amphioxus that we talked about earlier. Really simple in its structure. Neither of these two have what we call paired fins pectoral fins on the front that you'd see moving about like I used seeing a goldfish or any other kind of shark or anything like that. Uh, so they lack the paired fins, they just have a single fin down the middle of the back and on the tail, uh, that's about it. Uh, but anyway, the lamprey, that little thing that looks a lot like an amphioxus, will, the amoceti larva, sits in uh, the substrate in a freshwater stream typically. So they're have their head sticking up above the substrate and feed on material that is available there passing by. So anyway, a lot of the lamprey go through several years, uh, at least a few years, in this larval stage where they're, they're tiny little uh, larval stage that uh, gets bigger and bigger uh, with each year and eventually becomes a, a free swimming adult. It no longer is embedded in the substrate and it has that, the larval characteristics. But once it becomes an adult, many of those, especially those we have here in eastern Kentucky, uh, do not have a prolonged adult stage. Once they reach the adult stage, they swim to a place to lie, uh, well, to lay eggs. They dig out a little nest. Uh, so they deposit their eggs, and then they're essentially goddards. Uh, very much like salmon that swim upstream to breed and then die. These uh, small lamprey do the same thing. Some of the lamprey get larger and are parasitic. They have a prolonged adult stage, uh, living stage, where they attach to other fish, primarily other organisms, but mainly fish, and uh, kind of like a leech on the side of the animal. And they have rows of teeth surrounding their mouth opening, unlike the hagfish. And they also have that rasping tongue. So they have both characteristics to feed on whatever prey, um, or I should say host, uh, they're parasit parasitizing at the time. So those are some of the main differences between hagfish and lamprey. And lamprey, I've mentioned, I think, before, that they uh, are mostly freshwater. Some of them will go into salt water and then come back to freshwater to breed. But anyway, hagfish and lamprey, the jawless fishes, also known as cyclostomes because of their circular mouth, um, also agnathans because they don't have jaws. So that leads us to our next fish on the chart.
chondrichthian fish, chondrichthes. Uh, the main feature we had for this group was the presence of jaws, right? So they are known as nathostomes, nathostomes, because they have jaws. Chondrichthian fish. Uh, there are two primary groups of chondrichthian fish we need to talk about. First of all, we know that these are cartilaginous fish, right? We call them the cartilaginous fish because unlike the other higher fish, they do not have bone in their endoskeleton. So the chondrichthian fish. Stemming from this chondrichthian lineage, we have two different types. We have what we call elasmobranchs. Those are your sharks, skates, and rays. Sharks, skates, and rays are elasmobranchs. And then we have holocephalans. And that includes the ratfishes. Now I need to uh, explain a few things about these two groups, so we're going to make us clean space on the board. All right, we'll begin by talking about the holocephalon. These are the rat fishes called holocephalons. Holo means com whole or complete. Cephal cephalon refers to the uh, head. So it has a whole or complete head. What does that mean? That means that the upper jaw region is actually part of the neurocranium, the whole uh, uh, skull structure here. So here, upper jaw fused to what we'll call the brain case or neurocranium. So they're put together in one piece. So that's holocephalans. If you're not a holocephalon and you're a chondrichthian fish, you're a shark, skate, or ray, you're in that other group, what we call the elasmobranchs. Their upper jaw and is separate from their, their neurocranium or brain case. So we'll say it's free from brain case. So this is a little bit odd to think about because we don't have our upper jaw free from our brain case. Imagine that your teeth were set in a separate bone that could move just like your lower jaw can move. So you had an upper jaw moving and a lower jaw moving at the same time. You can often see this on your uh, television programs where we're doing a, a shark week or something like that. They show a lot of these sharks with their mouths agape and when they open up their mouth really big, you can see their upper jaw swing out away from the rest of their head just a little bit, giving them this broad upper lip region just below their snout. So that comes down a bit as well as the lower jaw coming down when they really open their, their mouths wide. Um, so anyway, and uh, the teeth would be found, of course, right along here. And uh, the ratfish that has the upper jaw fused to the brain case. And it's got more like plate-like uh, things, not quite like the typical shark teeth that we're familiar with. It's got crushing plates in there in the upper and lower jaw that help to uh, break up its food. So anyway, it's got teeth that are a little bit different, but it, mainly we see this difference in the skull. Where in the holocephalans, the upper jaw is part of the brain case, and in the shark skates and rays, that upper jaw is completely free of the rest of the brain case and can move uh, separately from it a bit. So that's the first difference between the elasmobranchs and the holocephalans. Um, the term elasmobranch means naked gills. So if we had the rest of the animal drawn on here, we would, and we've seen this in sharks, there are these gill openings back in the back separate gill openings. We see this in the sharks, skates, and rays, these separate gill openings on the outside of the body. 
uh, something like a, a goldfish or a trout or something like that, we see just a, a flap covering the gills and there's one opening to that. That's called an operculum. So a shark does not have that covering, that operculum covering over its gills, covering all of its gills. The ratfish does have an operculum. So instead of having these separate gill openings like we see in a shark, it has just one a slot that leads into where the gills are up ahead there. So the gills would be behind this flap, so their gills are hidden, they're not exposed. So elasmobranch means naked gills, separate gill openings, not covered by an operculum. Holocephalans have an operculum covering their gills. Okay, now we're ready to move on to our Actinopterygian fish, our first bony fish group. And uh, if you'll recall, as we headed up here, we said the primary character that separated the next groups out along this lineage, this uh, the presence of an air bladder. The air bladder separates higher fish from the chondrichthyan fish. And uh, we have two groups that stem from this. We're going to look at this one in a minute, the Sarcopterygians. And over on this side, the ray fin fishes, the Actinopterygians. So ray fin, because their fin is not supported at the base typically by a fleshy a muscular structure or a skeletal arrangement that's similar to what we see in sarcopterygians. We do see though those, those little filaments that go out through the fins, uh, that's why we call it a ray fin fish, it's like rays going out from the base toward the tip of the fin. Uh, the actinopterygians. Now along this path the actinopterygians we recognize some separate uh, groups. Um, kind of unfortunately, the, the first lineage here, the more primitive types of actinopterygians are often referred to as chondrostians as a whole. Uh, there are three different varieties, and the first variety we're going to talk about here, Polypterus, is not that cartilaginous, so it's, it doesn't seem to fit with the other two. The other two, which are better known groups, are the paddlefish, also known as the spoonbill or spoonbill cat, um, and then the uh, sturgeon. We'll look at a Polypterus here in a minute. I'll get some video of uh, one from the aquarium. Uh, paddlefish and sturgeon are very large fishes and can be caught even locally. They've begun to stock uh, lake sturgeons back into um, um, the Cumberland River downstream from Cumberland Falls. They've been putting them in there for some years. Um, they supposedly were native to that at one point in, in time in history but are no longer present there. Naturally, they've been stopping it. Paddlefish, or the spoonbill, um, also very large fish, and they are characterized by having an elongated paddle of a snout that sticks out in front of their head. And uh, they are filter feeders. They swim through the water with their mouth open. Any little tiny fish or invertebrates or anything they encounter while they're swimming through the water, they'll catch in there in their big gaping mouth. Uh, the sturgeons feed primarily on the bottom. They stay on the bottom all the time, just checking around. They have little uh, uh, whisker-like tentacles around their mouth where they are, are trying to sniff out available food on the floor of a river, usually river, not often lakes, but uh, mostly rivers that 
sturgeon are feeding in. These are freshwater, all, all three of them, freshwater fish. Let's take a look at the polypterus next. I'll try to get the camera over to the aquarium. So here's a polypterous fish. It is characterized by having a unique kind of scale on the outside of the body. It has a, a, an extra uh, tough kind of bony plate within it and an, a hard enamel covering, enamel-like covering, not really enamel. Um, these have uh, the whole series of fins down the middle of the back, separate little fins. That's why it gets the name polypterous, poly for many. P-T-E-R-Y, that teri portion is referring to a fin, so the mini finned fish. It has a little bit of muscle even at the very base of its pectoral fin up there at the front. Uh, it has its air bladders divided into two. The right side, I think, is the larger, but it has two, uh, two lungs, essentially, in there. It has some other uh, more primitive kinds of features. It has a spiracle, it has a spiral valve intestine. So anyway, it, the, there are about a dozen species of these in Africa, in what, mainly northern Africa, is where you find these. Considered the most basal of the bony fish groups. All right, we just looked at the polypterus. The uh, sturgeon and spoonbill up here are sometimes grouped with the polypterus and a single group. Um, spoonbill and sturgeon as a group right here should be referred to as the chondrostians on their own. Uh, the name chondrostian, C-H-O-N, chondro is its cartilage. Ostean as in bone. So chondrostians, these two together, because their skeleton is uh, largely cartilage with a little bit of bone. Sometimes polypterus is lumped in with that group, uh, but its skeleton is more bony, so that's not a very good fit for that. So these are considered the older fish. There should be a name for all the older fish. And then everything else is considered a new fish. It's called a neopterygian. All this group up here, these are neopterygians. And I have three different directions going out on this chart up here. Uh, the first two on this side are considered primitive types among that lineage. And it includes the bowfin and the gars, all the garfish. There's only one species of bowfin. It lives in the... Uh, uh, the lower portions of the Mississippi drainage. Um, it's found in western Kentucky on down through the southern states along the coastal plain states from Louisiana and probably Texas across into Florida. But anyway, the bowfin has some more primitive characteristics than the remainder of the Teleos group. And then the gars also have more primitive features. They have a scale very similar to the polypterus and having kind of a bony layer in there. So anyway, there's the gars and the bowfin, off in a group, and these are sometimes referred to as the whole ostians. The gar and the bowfin. The remainder of the fish over here, these are going to be the teleos. 
sometimes called the modern bony fish, modern bony fish. So, on this lineage, above the chondrosteans, we have the air bladder for the first time, and we have two different branches, the actinopterygians, these are also known, as we said, as ray finned fishes. Actin, that prefix refers to a filamentous structure, so this refers to the filaments that go out into the fin of a ray finned fish. Um, Polypterus being the most primitive form, the most basal form in, in the fish here, uh, the bony fish, and the sturgeon and spoonbill being uh, closely allied to that and grouped into a group we call the chondrostians. And then up here among the neopterygians, the new fish types, uh, we have two that are considered holosteans because their entire skeleton is very bony, the gars and the bowfin, and then the teleos, all the modern fish. Now there are thousands and thousands of teleos fish. It includes everything uh, from many of the eels. The uh, seahorse is a teleos fish. Um, your goldfish and most of the carps and minnows are in that group. A lot of the minnow-like fish, just all, almost all fish in the ocean and on in freshwater are going to be teleos, catfishes and so on. The only things that are teleos in this uh, ray fin fish group, the actinopterygian group, include the single species of bowfin, about a dozen species of gars, uh, about a, well, there's several species of sturgeon. There's one spoonbill, we'll talk about that in a minute, and about a dozen species of polypterids, um, maybe 14. But anyway, the spoonbill, back to that for a second. There's one species that lives in the United States in the Mississippi drainage system. Um, but in China, there was, at least, another spoonbill, the Chinese version of a paddlefish. Didn't have quite as long a paddle on its snout, but got to be even larger than our uh, spoonbill uh, here. But it's thought that probably it's been completely fished out of the rivers where it's native in China. So it may be an extinct species, that uh, Chinese version. And so that's been within my lifetime that uh, uh, they think that's probably become extinct, the spoonbill. So, like I say, just about about 20 some species, uh, less than 30 probably in all this, all these groups over here. Um, well, 30 something. And then thousands upon thousands of teleos fish. The modern bony fish. Now let's look at this other branch here, the sarcopterygians. Sarcopterygians. We have, um, remember these are fleshy fan fish. So we have the fleshy fan as the characteristic we're dealing with here. Also called lobe finned fishes, the lobe finned fishes. So that's this group. Two major outgroups here. One that we one living form we know as uh, the coelacanth. There's uh, two species of living coelacanth we believe and then uh, I'm not sure quite how many species of lungfishes. So the coelacanth group and the lungfish group, two separate groups from the sarcopterygian lineage. Um, coelacanths and their allies are in a group that's referred to as crossopterygians. Lungfish are sometimes referred to as dipnoans. So if you see that term in a textbook somewhere, dipnoan, they're referring to the modern lungfish lineage, even though there are some fossil forms of dipnoans as well. Um, so let's talk about these for just a minute. The coelacanth, lobe-finned fish, has muscle at the base of its fin and then some rays going out beyond that. But anyway, the base of it is muscular with the skeletal uh, inclusion, a bit of skeleton, a bony component, and then muscle at the base of the, the fins there. Oh, uh, let's see. 
It was uh, thought to be extinct. They thought it probably went extinct with the dinosaurs over 60 million years ago. They had many fossils of this kind of fish uh, dating back at least 100 years before they actually found the fish alive off the coast of South Africa. So that was a big deal when that was discovered and it was another 14 years I think before the second one was caught. Uh, the first one nearly rotted uh, away before they could do anything about studying its anatomy. So they just had the skin, they had a preserved taxidermy specimen of the first coelacanth for quite a while. But then eventually they started finding other places where they could find specimens of the coelacanth. So that's kind of like a living fossil form out there. So, Like I said, there are a lot of uh, fossils that were known to uh, museums before they actually found a fish of the coelacanth. The lungfishes, there are lungfishes in Australia, Africa, and South America. There's only one species in Australia, the Queensland lungfish. There are um, a few species in Africa and a few species in South America, I believe, that's the way that works. But anyway, the uh, lungfish in Australia has fins that are more similar to the coelacanth with a muscular base and then a, a paddle-like lobe reaching out from the side of the body. Uh, the other lungfishes in South America and in Africa, their fins are much reduced to a narrow filament that sticks out from the side of the body, kind of like a, a tentacle. They can move their, their fin, kind of like a, a long tentacle. So anyway, that's a, a the second group of sarcopterygians, the coelacanth, the lungfish. One important thing to bring out here, it's thought that the descendants of this sarcopterygian, sarcopterygian line were the eventual forebearers of a tetrapod. So it's the next group we're going to look at, the tetrapod group out here, is thought to be derived from this crossopterygian group. And there's an example called Eustenopteron, E-U-S-T-H-E-N-O-P-T-E-R-O-N, -E -E Eustenopteron. Eustenopteron has characteristics that make it similar to um, the earliest fossil tetrapods that we have. There's a lot of similarities in the skeletal structure between Eustenopteron and the next thing we'll look at will be Ichthyostega, our most primitive example of a tetrapod organism of considered the first amphibian type. So there's our fish. I think we've covered it all. Um, so next we're going to look at some examples of some of these fish that we have in our collection here in the biology department. Okay, here we are with a few examples of fish from our preserved collections in the anatomy lab. We're going to start by looking at the uh, lamprey. We don't have any hagfish uh, to look at, but we have three, I have three lamprey that are really old specimens here. Uh, here's the uh, circle mouth arrangement, and inside there you may be able to see some teeth inside there, if it's focusing all right on that, but anyway. That's the mouth, so it doesn't have jaws like that. Uh, its eyes are a little bit difficult to make out. They're just a little lighter colored on the side here. And along the side of the animal, there are these pores in a series. Those are the gill outlets, the excurrent flow for water from the pharynx to the outside of the body. So our gill openings along the side there. Um, Since this is a uh, craniate organism, there would be cartilaginous structures in there supporting the, the skull and also on the tongue, which you, the tongue just barely is exposed in the middle of the mouth, right in there. Um, so anyway, there's a lamprey. No paired fins, no left and right fins, just, just a little bit of a fin down the middle of the back and then on the, the tail. Of the animal. Don't have many with the tail. There's a little bit of the tail there. And the dorsal fin right there. 
Now the next thing up the chain, I, I don't have a shark out here, but most people know what a shark looks like. I do have a ratfish, which few people have seen a ratfish to know what it looks like. It's a ugly looking thing. It's got very large fins here on the front, pectoral fin, like wings almost sticking out, really large pectoral fins. And its tail is just a long pointed uh, structure. It has fins above and below and then it's pointed on the end, so that's why they call it a ratfish. Uh, looking at it in the face here, right there, is the mouth, and it has crushing plates in there to feed, and it's two nostrils right there. So anyway, here's a ratfish. This is a very old and ugly preserved specimen of the ratfish. Remember that it is a uh, holocephalon. Its entire skull is together, not the upper jaw is not separate from the brain case like it would be in a shark. And it is not an elasma brank like the shark skates and rays. It has an opercular covering, which I can't quite get my finger underneath right there. Let's see. I can kind of put my probe in it there. So this is the opercular covering. There are gills up inside there. So anyway, there's our ratfish. A cartilaginous fish. Next, as we go to our bony fish, we've already seen examples of uh, the example of the polypterous fish in there. Um, paddlefish, uh, this is not good, but uh, it's the only paddlefish I have in the, in the room. There's a tiny paddlefish in this bottle, and it's, its nose, its snout is now wrapped around sideways in there. It doesn't stick out straight any longer. Uh, but anyway, there's a paddlefish in a bottle. It has been in this bottle since uh, 1928, so it's over 90 years it's been preserved in there. And that's a very, very tiny uh, spoonbill. They get to be about five feet long. The sturgeon, here's a nice specimen of a sturgeon. This is from a hatchery in uh, Georgia, I believe, is where that came from. But uh, anyway, it's got some spiny scales on the outside. Um, main characteristic should have been that it uh, has an air bladder, but all the sturgeons have lost their air bladders, as you remember saying earlier. So it doesn't have an air bladder, though it's thought to be derived from forms that would have an air bladder. Its uh, skeleton is largely cartilaginous, although there's some bone in there. So it's a bony fish, but consider very primitive form of a bony fish. You can see its mouth and uh, the little whisker like uh, tentacles sticking down there in front of the mouth on the snout. Its nostrils right here, the eye there. Has a heterocircle tail like a shark would have with the upper lobe being longer and having a bit of uh, the spine going into it and then a lower lobe down below. It's a more shark-like tail as the paddlefish would have. So the paddlefish and this fish are in the chondrostian group, uh, meaning that they are uh, partly cartilaginous. I do have one bow fin here. This is the whole osteian group, has more bony uh, skeleton there in the head, and we'll look at the bony skull of this later on in the class. It's an important uh, example of uh, skeletal condition we'll look at later on. But um, anyway, there's, there's a bow fin. The fin on the back is not sticking up right, but it, it would be a long fin across the back and a nice rounded tail, nice cylindrical body. There's the bow fin. This and the gar, which I don't have a gar fish for us to look at. Gar would have larger uh, scales, diamond shaped scales along its body. And of course, gars have that long pointed snout. I do have an example of a lungfish here. This is an African lungfish, and I mentioned that filamentous type. Oops, I just broke off the end of its uh, pectoral fin here. So there's another pectoral fin there, pelvic fin there. So anyway, there's a lungfish. This is a uh, considered a lobe fin fish. These things have muscle that extend. These fins have muscle that extend out in there. So they can move that around kind of like an octopus would move a tentacle uh, out there.
Yeah, and look at some pictures. So as far as the pictures go, I don't have any pictures of lamprey that are all that uh, that good from our textbooks. But um, here's a view of that uh, shows Polypterus, sturgeon, and spoonbill in a series there. So those are our basal actinopterygians. Uh, these two are, are mostly cartilaginous. The Polypterus not so much, but they're all kind of grouped as the chondrostians. Chondrostians, okay. Another view of a similar set of images here, Polypterus, Sturgeon, and Spoonbill. So those represent our primitive uh, ray finned fishes, the Chondrostean group. And then down here we have the Bowfin and Agar. Bowfin and Agar are the Holosteans, considered a Neopterygian fish or newer fish, but still uh, in a separate group from the rest of the Teleost fish that we're familiar with. Here's a picture of some, uh, some lungfish. This is the, the Australian lungfish, the uh, South American lungfish, and then the African lungfish. This last picture is not a lungfish. It's an amphibian, so we're not concerned with that, but that shows the variation in lungfish. Only the Australian variety shows the uh, uh, fins, the paddle-like fins of the more ancient type of lungfish that are in the fossil record. The modern lungfish from South America and Africa have developed more of a filamentous type fin in the front. Images of the coelacanth, not so good here, but anyway, there's a coelacanth image right there, and there's that Australian lungfish for a comparison, um, showing lobe-finned fishes in this textbook. Here's a photograph of the actual coelacanth. I think this is the, maybe the first one that was discovered uh, in that picture, or maybe a later one. But anyhow, that's the coelacanth with its muscle base on its fin and then the ray fin part coming out from that on both the pectoral fin and the pelvic fin and even this extra dorsal fin here has in the back an extra little piece of the tail fin so it's got a like a tail fin in the middle of the tail fin back here. The fin skeleton of some of these, uh, this is the lungfish, um, the Australian lungfish type, where you have a long series of bones going out into the limb. A teleost fish, a modern bony fish, would not have any bones going out into the fin there. So anyway, and this is the base of Polypterus. It also has um, some skeletal elements there at the base of the fin, a little more like a shark uh, arrangement there. And the, these are, uh, this is a crossopterygian fish, more like the coelacanth here, and then a tetrapod with an actual toes sticking out down here. Here's a picture of uh, Eusthenopteron. This is from a fossil record. This is a, a reconstruction or an artistic uh, rendition of a crossopterygian similar to coelacanth with that same kind of muscle base to the fin seen here and an extension of the middle part, part of the uh, uh, body going out into the fin right here so well, that fin in a fin arrangement. Um, so there's Eusthenopteron thought to be a precursor to the tetrapods and very similar in many respects to this amphibian example right here, Ichthyostega, which we'll look at later. Now one more point to bring out. Both the uh, Eusthenopteron and the Ichthyostega are in a group of uh, animals that are referred to as labyrinthodont. That means that their tooth is a labyrinth or it has uh, some special uh, 
intricate folds around the margin of the tooth, which is fairly unique. Here's a picture of that peg-like tooth with grooves along the side. That's the labyrinthodont tooth. And if you make a cross-section of the tooth, you see that the uh, dentin and enamel is thrown into these folds. 